their gods are metal and wood. Carved mouths that cannot talk. Painted eyes that cannot see. Tin ears that cannot hear. Molded noses that cannot smell. Hands that cannot grasp. Feet that cannot walk. Throats that never utter a sound. Those who make idols have become just like them. They have become just like the gods they worship. That was my first time seeing that intro. That was awesome. Way to go, graphics department and everybody else. They give them a round of applause. I'm like sitting there watching, and I'm like, oh, this looks great. Oh, wait, I'm preaching this. I better go up there. Like, so praise God. And uh, no, no, just praise God, period. No, and uh. Um, if, before I get started, though, if you're going to Africa on this mission trip, will you go ahead and just stand up, please? All right. We all want you to bring home a baby lion. A lion of, we have seen Lion King and we want one. Exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray for you. And if you know him, if you love him, put your hand on him. If you don't know, nah, don't be creepy. So I would call you guys up, but then the, the platform would collapse. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now. As they go out into this world, as they go out and they leave these four walls that we call East Coast Christian Center, that, that they're going to go out and they're going to cross our planet. And they're going to proclaim the name of Jesus. They are going to shine a light into a world that needs your love, that is crying out for you. Father, right now we declare that the message you are delivering with these men and women will hit right on time, right at the proper spot, that nothing can get in their way. We speak right now that there is health and life and protection and direction and vision and inspiration right now from the Holy Spirit resting on these men and women as they go out and the boldness that you've given them. Father, they've slayed the giants on this side of the planet and now you are going to send them to slay the giants on the other side of the planet. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Okay, go ahead. Take a seat. Take a seat. Super proud of you guys. If you guys don't know the financial testimony that came in from that, that I, let me elaborate a little bit more. Um, that uh, we actually, as a ministry team, as elders, got together and we discussed um, the Africa trip, the Cameroon trip that was coming up. It was like three grand plus. What was the total cost? Three thousand nine hundred fifty, so four thousand dollars, right? You know, plus tax. And uh, so we were talking about it and going around, and we were we were saying we were saying, well, we might need to help this group. We might need to step in because that's a big chunk. We're months out, and we're like, we might need to step in because that's a big chunk. And the senior pastor said, absolutely not. We need to let God be God. And at that time, like you heard, 50% of them are Mezzanites. I'm biting my fingernails because I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not a man of little faith or I'm not a man of no faith. But I'm like, you know what, people I love very dearly are, are scheduled to go on this trip. And I don't want to act like, you know, we did nothing to help them. And, and sure enough, God showed up and all the provision came in. They're actually, the trip overall is $8,000 in the positive above what they needed to go to Africa. So praise God. Listen, I know, I know right now some people might have uh, financial mountains or adversities. Listen, okay, if you're new to church, we're a little bit weird, all right? We don't like to say the word issues or problems. We say mountains and giants, all right? So if you hear that from me, just translate it in your head. You'll be fine. It'll work out. Um, I try my best not to speak Christianese, but I'll be honest, I listen to Z88, okay? I, I need something safe for the little ears, okay? 
And I'm talking about my little ears, not my kids, because if you get me started, I will rant all day. There's a reason I don't listen to talk radio. Um, but praise God for the ones going to Africa. Praise God that, you know what, when he calls you to it, he'll provide you and equip you for it. And, and I just want to say this, too. If, you know, if your heart is to be a minister of the gospel, um, you don't have to go to some far-off land. I'm not talking about, uh, this is a missions trip. I'm not talking about you guys now. You know, you don't have to go far off to, to learn leadership and ministry and, and how to be a pastor and how to be a leader inside of a church. We can do that right here, and, and we're doing that in a lot of ways. And if that's something where you feel called to the ministry, come talk to me. Come say, hey, I feel called, like God's calling me into the ministry. And I'll be like, awesome, praise God, and we'll set you down that road. And we'll, we'll send you on, you know, the path where that it takes to, to do that. And I'll be honest with you, it isn't by offering you a job at the church. That's often what people want. But the truth is, is it's about teaching you to respond to the call that Jesus has put in your heart. So when we do that, then we'll take the first step. But I want to encourage all of you guys that God's speaking to every one of you about a direction to go, a step to take. And, and I want to help you on that path because mezzanine is not me on this platform or the worship team on this platform. We're not want to be you know, celebrity people or wannabe performers. Um, what we are is God's people in this specific generation shining a light to a world that needs it. So, man, I want to answer that call. And, and flat out, like the New England Patriots say, I want to do my job, you know, do my job. I want to do my, how many Patriots fans in here? You guys are still kind of quiet. All right, okay, okay. You guys lost. And uh, okay, <laughs> you did, you did, you did. But uh, I, lo I do love what they say. Do your job. And I look at you guys, and I want, I want to be a part of God's story in your life and helping you guys get to that area, what it means, because um, it's a passion of mine. It's absolutely a passion of mine. So, okay, here we go. This message has been on my heart for months. And if you're close to me, you know I have been babbling about it for months now. I've been like, I'm going to do a more. A, a, I can't even say it right. I'm going to do a message series on worship. I'm going to do a message series on worship because this is something that's very close to my heart. So I'm so excited now. I do not know why I'm procrastinating to get started. I do not know why I keep arranging the pulpit like I'm going to be standing near this thing that much. Can I say one more thing before I go into this? Megan? I heard that. Okay, just because you're on the screen. You look swole, too. You're like chains, broken. <laughs> All right, we'll go in. I know, right? You did great, though. And why are you running behind that car? Darius, pull over, bro. Let your girl in. <laughs> Have you watched any of the dating series? What's wrong with you? You're like, that's our guardrails, Pastor. That's, you know. All right. One last thing before we go in. And if you're new, you're like, oh, my gosh, will this guy ever preach? Absolutely. I won't ever stop, all right? <sighs> Guess what? Big win today. Big win today. You guys are going to say Tampa over New York. No, because I have a lot of New York friends, and I love you guys. I love you guys, so I'm not going to do that. But yay, Tampa. My son's soccer team won their first game. Yes. Oh, no, it was brutal. I walked off the field two weeks ago, 11 to 1 loss, and these parents are like, who are you? What are you doing? You are horrendous. You smell like beef and cheese. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then finally, you know, we took a 7 to 1 win. Not that we're supposed to be keeping score, but I am. So <laughs> praise God. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for everything you are doing as we now go into your presence, as we now put aside the things that captivate us, that capture us, that consume us, whether they are on the outside of us or on the inside of us, that we are not going to be people ensnared by thoughts that are not from the kingdom of heaven, by emotions that are not from your heart and your hand, or by desires that are not from you. Right now in this place, your name your name reigns, Jesus. And we lift it up. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 
I want to open with reading a scripture today. Usually I'll open with a funny story of some point, but I believe I've drugged my feet long enough. So if you're following along, I want to get to this point in time where we're going to look at Jesus in a moment as Jesus goes and he encounters a woman at a well. And in this famous story that we know, the, the idea, the topic, and the notion of worship comes up. And as you saw in the beginning, if you're able to see online, that this idea of worship, of what this woman who would become an awesome evangelist, a powerful evangelist into her community, moments from this conversation, when you look at her perspective of worship, of what she knows and what it is, and then you look at what Jesus responds in that moment with, you would say, wow. They're quite different. They're quite different. You see, in this moment, Jesus was in a place. Jesus had left his disciples, had wound up at a well, and he wound up in a moment isolated with this lady who was broken, who was embarrassed. In previous, we know from previous scriptures here that that she's at the well at noon. You don't go to a well at noon. It's hot. You go early in the morning because that's when you need water. But she's there at noon, she's by herself, and she is isolated. So it tells us this, that this moment for Jesus is important because he doesn't make it big, he makes it intimate. And I want to take a look now and let's look at this word worship as we go into our Christian lives and our thought processes and our heart sets. I want to take a look at this conversation and we're going to kind of break it apart tonight to find out what Jesus is saying Because our perspective and our view of worship might be skewed inside the modern church. We might not grasp all of what it is, and at the same time, we might not know what any of it is. But we do know everything we need is within the Holy Scripture and is breathed from the Holy Spirit. So John would scribe this. John writes, our fathers worshiped. Now this is Jesus in the conversation, opening up with what the woman is going to say. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. She was a Samaritan, which means that she was not fully Jewish. She was only half Jewish. But by Jewish law, that meant you were not Jewish. So she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews, you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Division Division, Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Come on, that's good. Unless I just read that, and you have no clue what I'm talking about, which I think would still be a lot of people. So that's why we're going to unpack it. I want to take a look at this. I love how how it opens up. First, I want to say, what does the word worship mean? When you go into the Greek here, and you go into the Greek here, the word the word worship, it's like it means to extend your hand towards with love. Extend your hand towards with love, as in like a kissing kissing formation, like a kissing gesture towards it. All right which normally you might look and poetically, and if I was probably Usher or somebody writing a song, I would make it like blowing a kiss to somebody. Sir, I am not blowing a kiss to you, all right? But I think we're there in our relationship. We're comfortable to do this. Like, um, it's not like blowing a kiss, and that seems romantic and poetic and beautiful, but actually when you look into it, it's more like the way a dog would come and lick its owner's hand. I will stop the licking motion with my face. (laughs) And at first I was like, well, that kind of steals from it. Like that kind of isn't as like Usher, Hallmark, beauty, like, like something you would give to your wife to make it sound like sensual and romantic. But if you think about it, 
when a dog runs up to its master full ready to like just show the love to the master isn't that dog crazy that dog is just like, I love you so much. Where are you going? Why are you trying to dodge me? I'm here. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to get you. And like, you know, it's, they are focused. They're hopping up. You got to keep them off you. You got to be like, whoa. And you could, you could try anything you want, but that dog is going to get you. But unfortunately, it's going at you with a tongue, and that's pretty gross. All right? But it's saying worship. Worship is what? It's a focused, extended love and affection and direction. That's what it means. That's what it means. Another, another, and we see this, we see this, but it has more, it, has a, it actually goes a little bit deeper. It's like not only is it to be focused and directed and to be looking to, to give your love, to give, to give your affection, because I've never met, see, if, if it was the reverse, if it was reversed and it was meant to just receive the affection and you were like, not like that, like dog going after, just looking to receive the affection, you would be a cat. All right? Because that's what cats are. They're like, yes, come over here. What are you, your home? What time are you supposed to be home? Get over here and pet me. I'm done with you. <laughs> it's a cat. That's why the Bible doesn't say worship like a cat. It says be excited. You have a good master. He's good. But it also means, what we see in Scripture, Hector, because I pick on Hector every night, um, we see as Abraham would go up in Genesis, and he's going to go up the mountain. If you don't know who Abraham is, he's one of the founding patriarchs, fathers of the faith of Christianity and Judaism, and, and he's in the Torah, and he's in the Bible, and um, he is going to go up, and he has a famous moment in Scripture where he's going to go, and he's going to sacrifice his son, Isaac, and he's telling the people that have come and uh, to help him because he has, like, servants. He's like, stay here, for I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship. Now... Knowing this Labrador kind of love we want to have for God, it would be a struggle for me to think that Abraham was like, stay here. I'm about to go full puppy chow up there for God. Because when you dig in deeper to the word worship means to prostrate oneself in like a bow like a bow, but not just like in like a bow like, I don't know, like you're about to like begin a karate fight, you know, like it means, and this would even translate, it's one of the few things that translate over to what Gentiles or what Persians in the Old Testament, what the other tribes outside of the Jewish speaking language would actually understand this gesture. They'd have a different word, but they would understand the gesture when you walked up and if you bow and you put your forehead to the ground, you were saying two things. I give you honor and I submit to your authority. I give you honor and I submit to your authority. Worship means to extend your love, to give the honor and to submit to the authority. So much bigger than maybe we've allowed it to be in our heart. But as Jesus goes into this conversation, as now we have a perspective of what the word worship looks and means, like the conversation would go to a particular place where it would say in this verse 21, Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. He looked at this woman and said, you don't even know what you worship. He said, you don't know what you worship. 
You see, you go through traditions and rituals, and you do different things physically, emotionally, what you think is spiritually, but you have no clue of what's going on or what's happening. And we can look to this as we see, as we analyze our own hearts and our own lives, and we look at ourselves maybe before we knew Jesus. Maybe if we took a second, we didn't get self-righteous, we don't get condemning, and we don't get judging, but if we just took an honest moment and we could look at maybe the culture around us, we can look outside and say, wait a second, I think there was a time in my life and I think there's a time going right now in other people's lives where I can say, you don't know what you're worshiping. What are you bowing down to? What are you sending your love towards? What are you giving the honor to? Where is it going? Worship's just not a song that we sing but it's something that actually flows out of us. If you look at those songs tonight, the lyrics are what? All lyrics lifting up the name of Jesus, giving praise to the name of Jesus, lifting up the, the, the name of God, giving honor to him, showing love to him. But that's a momentary flow. That's a momentary moment that is supposed to be a picture of our actual whole life. So what then, if we had to sing an honest song of worship, would come out of us? What would flow out of you? What would it be? I know as I look, and if I looked at myself before Christ, and if I look at some people who I know in this world who don't know Jesus, it would be, man, my love, my attention, my, my value goes to sex. What will it take to get sex? I'm going to make it very uncomfortable in here for the next couple moments. But you crave it. You look at pornography. You're willing to love Jesus maybe, but definitely people who don't, you're willing to devalue yourself to obtain that physical pleasure, whether it's fornication or masturbation or whatever it looks like. You're like, I value sex. You're in good news. God values sex too. But where are you putting it? And are you bowing down to it? That's what God's asking today. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. And sometimes the very gods that we worship are idols that we've placed in our own hearts. I saw a generation afraid of Harry Potter. How ridiculous is that? Meanwhile, everybody I know is judging everybody else. Why? Covetous, idol in the heart. What are you bowing down to? Another thing you bow down to, what do we bow down to? Money. How am I going to make money? How am I going to get money? Dear Lord, if another rapper talks about money, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, it's like money. We need this. We need that money. Why? Because we're built to inside of us always have the question since the fall of man, what am I going to do for my provision? Why do you think Corey is men when we meet each other? We say, what do you do for a living? Because I want to assess your value in this world. If you're like, oh, I'm, I don't know, I don't want to pick on any profession, but maybe a profession that people aren't proud of, we'd be like, oh, okay, cool, on to another conversation. Except we see the cool jacket and kind of cool mustache, and we would be like, let's talk to him. Really cool mustache. I'm just jealous. I can't have facial hair. My wife won't let me. No, but I'm serious. She won't let me. (laughs) What if he was like, I'm a doctor. We'd be like, wow, you're a doctor. I'm going to talk to you. Hey, can you look at this? You know, like, you know, like. (laughs) Why? Because money. Money. You know, people daydream. People daydream, Aiden. They are. They're like, oh, if I won the Powerball for $6 billion, you know what I would do? Then you like, the first two things are like a lie. They're a lie. I'd give to my church. And I'd buy my parents a house. Yeah, okay. You buy your parents a condo, all right? <laughs> Here you go, Mom. You weren't that great. Boom, condo. Roasted. We do. We worship money. We look at money. We're like, man, what if I did, if I did, what, you know, and then you start thinking about that stuff. Nobody ever says, God, man, what I would do if you would just give me every opportunity to help people. Bless me with the opportunity to be in someone's life, to be in their story, and be in the blessing. Man, anybody a Guardians of the Galaxy fan? 
All right. Yes, I can't wait to take the story to fight Thanos. But, you know, Star-Lord chimes in and he says something. And, and my wife loves Guardians of the Galaxy now, so we're watching it. We watched the first one two times this weekend and the second one once. All right? And I love, I love what Star-Lord says. I love what Chris Pratt's character says. He's like, we're all losers. And, you know, they're all like, what? And he's like, you know, we've all lost something. He's like, well, we have something now. And they're like, what? I can't say what he actually says. All right. He says, you know what we have? We have the opportunity to give a shoot. <laughs> Never lose your give a shoot. Watch the movie, people. Never lose it. That is, <laughs> that is a gift from God. Not enough people today give a crap about the other person. It's more than a powerball. It's more than the lottery. It's the chance that we get to be the gateway, the life, and the light into someone else's world. Never lose your give a crap. Because it's powerful. It's an opportunity. Too many believers are wishing for money. They should just be wishing, praying, and believing for another opportunity to make a difference. I can't promise that I won't preach from the whole Avengers series, but I will preach from the Bible. Power. Power. People love power. I always get nervous when I see a flicker in someone's eyes when they get a little bit of authority. That's why I'm really slow to give titles out at Mezzanine. If you love God, you don't need a title to make a difference. You'll make the difference. All right? And most of the times, I find young pastors show their young pastors well before they're ever called pastor. Keith, Al Keith Alderman, there's no F in his name. Keith Alderman was making a difference in our youth well before he became Pastor Keith Alderman. So was Pastor Brian Moore. You are the pastor before we call you one. As Christians, that's how we live. You are the apostle before we call you one. It's powerful when you think like that. Some of you guys need to start saying, you know what? I'm the baddest entrepreneur you've ever met. You know what? I'm a songwriter. I'm a book writer. I write devotions. I write stuff that sets the captives free. The Holy Spirit works through me because I am an author, because my father is an author. And he is going to speak through me, whether through song or through the spoken word or through the written word or through video, whatever. Do you realize we live in a digital age that the communication in our generation is changing so rapidly that the church is incompetent to keep up with it? And that is why God is looking at this generation right now because you guys are snapchatting you guys are youtubing you guys are doing so many things that the last generation is like oh well i don't know if we should have a facebook the devil might be in it it's like what you know no no step out step out and where god's calling you to step out because you will be a voice amongst people who need to hear what god has to say through you it has nothing to do with power, but people crave power. I don't need to explain that. People, they, they crave power. People all, all the time at work, oh, we got a new manager. We got a new assistant manager. He's so power hungry. It's annoying. People claim they crave fame. They want fame. These are all idols. And when they come into your heart, you're like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to be happy to attain you. I'm going to give you the honor. I'm going to bow down to your authority. Whatever it would take for me to get that fame, to become a celebrity, whatever it is, whether it's girls, you got to give up some of yourself that you don't want to give up. Guys, whether it's act away, be away, talk away, to try and get into the right group because you think that that's going to take you where you need to go. Well, I want to encourage you, young man, young woman, right now that I'm speaking to you, like, I want to encourage you, young man, young woman. I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to talk to you. Fitness set you straight. And all of a sudden, now I'm from Kentucky or something. Let me help you. 
They threw a man in a well. He became the second in charge of all of Egypt. There was a shepherd boy that was pretty much the, the, the runt of his family, became the greatest king the Bible would ever see outside of Jesus. I mean, you want to go down the list. There was an exiled uh, outlaw who would later lead God's people out of Egypt, beating the most powerful man in the world and taking him to the edge of the promised land. His disciple would then take him the full way and clear out the promised land. Trust me, nothing about who's around you will lead you to where you need to go, but everything about who is in you will take you there. If it's outside of Scripture and outside of God's hand, you don't need it. Train your heart to not want it. There's a difference. Fame, fame. Don't crave fame, says the guy with the microphone. That's why I love to hand it off. That's why I love that, that Kyle got to preach last week. He did a phenomenal job. Show him some love. But here's a new one, right? I just went on a, 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 a rant, all right, Hannah, uh, of, of old ones, you know. Every preacher is going to talk about those things, right? He's not a good preacher. But here's a new one. And you've heard about it a little bit if you've been at Mezzanine for a little while now, at least a year. There's a new idol out there. Is that you guys have to face the demon that you're missing out on something better. That somehow there's a cool party or a cool event or whatever's going on or these people are hanging out and you're watching through Facebook Live and you're watching through Snapchat and you're watching through Instagram and you're like, why wasn't I invited? Why wasn't I there? Are you seeing you're just boiling inside and heaven forbid you just went through a breakup. Now it's like a billion times worse. Oh, why is she standing next to him? Huh? What, what, of all people, him, why she stands to him? What are they doing? It's like, you know, and it, it, all this stuff is smelling. Whoa. <laughs> Father. <laughs> okay. Somebody didn't tithe. It is. Eats you up. Eats you up something you ain't got nothing to do with. How many of y'all, don't raise your hands. How many of y'all have been eaten alive by something you had nothing to do with? You had no part in it anyways. You over there staring, wondering what she's up to when God's trying to get your attention over here because he's got the angel of your dreams. But you won't put the phone down. Girls, same thing, but just change the word verbiage. So what do we worship? You know, we, we see what is in us that we can be inclined to try and worship and pursue and give our love and give our honor and give our authority to, our submission to. But what, what do we actually do in that way? And Jesus responds with this. Like, Jesus responds with Garrett's pick. I almost fell and broke my leg, Garrett, on your pick. The Lord had delivered me from your snare. Draw nigh my dwelling. So what do we worship? Now, you would think and you would want the Messiah, the Christ, to answer with, you know, y'all worship me. You know, that's it. You know, I'm the Messiah. Y'all, you're going to worship me, and this is how it's going to be. And we want to, like, just bust something out. But he says this, and we know what we worship. He's still speaking as a Jew. He's not speaking as the Messiah. You would want him to like lay out all the kingdom of heaven right there and have that moment where he's just like, yeah, I can't think of nothing. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. And I love that he says that. For we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. And for me, I bleed hope. I love hope. So when I see that scripture, I'm like, salvation. That means provision. That means protection. That means healing. That means guidance. That's a very picture of Jesus. So I'm very excited to see the word salvation in there. I'm very excited if I see the word grace inside of scripture. I know what it means. It means so much more than our feeble verbiage could ever say what God is saying when he uses these words in scripture. But then what trips me up that I can't 
can't go past Antonio is how he says this. He says, we know what we worship. And I'm like, Jesus, right? We're like throwing down now. So it should be, we know who we worship. But Jesus says, we know what we worship. He says, for salvation is of the Jews. And I was like, wait a second. That's like one of those like, got them. You know, like, why didn't you say who? You said what? You know, I've all of a sudden turned into my ninth grade English teacher. But I have to know Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. I have to know Jesus. Why did you say what? We worship and not who. Because outside of Jesus, and that's where the Jews were. They were living in a, a religious system where the Messiah had not come yet. But everything from the law to the prophets would point at the Messiah. So he says, everything out of that, you can know the characteristics of God, but you do not actually fully know God. So he says that, you know what, what we worship, what we worship, because not only is he going to radically consume with the fire and a passion, all of that that seems to be important with the sex and the power and the money and the, and the desire to be somewhere else, he's also going to consume and replace with something better everything that we know about religion, everything that we know about church, everything that we know as a structure of organizing to put God in a box. He's saying you need to be careful because when you focus on the worship, God's going to blow your box apart no matter what it's made out of. That's why he said what? Because he is the who. And he's about to get to that. I don't want to be so Christian, I miss Christ. That's what happens when we fall in love with titles or services or whatever else. You know, I would talk with DJ. I love sitting and talking with DJ. And we were talking. And it's like, it's, it's profoundly simple, yet... Uh, it still is like consuming when you're like entrenched in the church world that it's like, you know, this is the only time I get to be with some of you guys, but I get to do a church service 52 times a year. So why would I ever care more about the service than I do the people? At the end of the day, it's you that matters. Not how long worship went or if the, you know, the person, if, if Garrett was in key or not or had the proper timing, which that would be a miracle. Just kidding. He's great. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I'm joking. Garrett's amazing. He's awesome. We can't lose that. That people are important. Nobody, I wasn't up here just pacing around and ranting, saying, why don't we shine the light in every service that we can? Because that's not what we're called to do. We're called to shine the light in the people's lives that we can so that's why, honestly, I don't care if stuff goes wrong all the time in a service. Guess what? We're going to have another service next week. We'll be all right. And I hope the mezzanine's stronger than someone messing up a little bit. I hope we have more grace and more love and more tolerance and more support for each other. Moments that make me cry, because I'm impervious to tears, but what almost make me cry is open mic nights. When, when someone that maybe is from a different community, maybe a special needs community, comes up and starts singing, and the mezzanine rallies around them. That's better than any message I could ever preach. When someone goes and does something and the Mezzanites come together as a family to help a person in need, that's better than any message I could ever preach. That is the songs that we're trying to sing. That is the church. That is the who. Let's not be a culture that is just focused on the what. We are so much more than a church service. So I'm passionate, right? And I get that. And yes, I've kind of always been this way. I actually like to watch football by myself because I even annoy myself sometimes. But when you're talking about God and you're talking about worship, you have to understand 
that sometimes in our, our tendency of our culture is that we can wrap worship in with feelings. Now, nobody here is a robot. I don't know if you're a robot. Pretty cool if you are. Talk to me after the service. Um, but what happens is, is I remember back in college, a little band called Bon Jovi, all right, was out. They were, they were popular then, Joseph, all right. You guys are like, oh, cool, he's in the classic rock. Shut up, you know. <laughs> and I would remember I would be at the bar and living on a prayer would come on, and we would all be like, whoa, we're halfway there. Whoa, I'll go there, living on a prayer. And I'm like, yeah, yes, I don't know what I'm yaying for. But we're halfway there. Where? I don't know. Definitely through this beer, you know. And I'm sure none of you have ever done that. And I'm not going to hate on being passionate about music. Be passionate about music. It should get you fired up. When you're working out, man, put that music on that, that, that pumps you up. You know, music, we're designed. We're emotional, we're emotional people, creatures that God created us. We're meant to have emotions. They, they, they protect us. I'm going to talk about that more. But what happens when you go to church and you're told, you know, when you have problems and you're hurting inside and something in life has wounded you and we are all passionate about the music, we are all like the music is what's going to help and the music is, is it and put it on and crank it as loud as you can and, and, and that's going to help you because you experienced something inside. You've been wounded. Inside, it's like your heart is bleeding and you feel alone and you can't explain it. And when you do, it's like it never comes out right. And if it does, it's like nobody understands. And you go into this super hyped up church, Bon Jovi concert, Buccaneer football game, and you're trying to talk to people and they're all like, you know, rah, rah, re, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And you're like, I love Jesus too, but I'm hurting inside. You go to get prayer, and the prayer counselor says, read your Bible, man, read your Bible, man, read your Bible, put some worship music on, and you'll be good, and there'll be, there'll be breakthrough for you. You'll see, and you, you read your Bible, and you might not fully understand it, and you put some worship music on, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, and, and you're confused, and you're, 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 you're inside, you're, you're struggling because you know you love God, you know you love Jesus, but it hurts inside. And then it gets to a point for some of you where you don't feel anything anymore. And you're numb. And someone says, put a song on. And you're like, I tried that. Read your Bible. And you're like, I know. I've tried that. I've been hearing that for years now. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate your concern. And you start feeling it inside. You know, the truth is, as we grow as a culture and a community, that depression and anxiety, we're learning some stuff about it now that we've never known before. And when I got saved, if you came out and said that you were suffering from depression, guess what we would tell you? Put a worship song on. Sing on your way home. Read your Bible. I want to... I want to talk about this a little bit because I do believe worship is the answer. I do believe that worship is powerful. But I also have to, have to take a moment. We have to take a moment as a group and understand that, that it is not music that we are attaching ourselves to, but it's the presence of God. Here are some things I will not say in the worship series to anybody who's struggling with depression. I will not tell you that your sins have caused your suffering. And I haven't. We've all sinned, and why aren't we all suffering? And I apologize for any Christian that might have said that to you. They don't know what they're talking about. All have fallen short. Your sin has not caused your suffering. You'll never hear me say you aren't really hurting, that you need to trust. You aren't really fully trusting the Lord enough. That is stupid as well. If you, you know, if you really had faith, you would feel better. Guess what? That's not true either. 
Some of us have been lied to by people that we love, and those people love you too. And I here want to speak on their behalf to apologize. And if you need to in your heart right now, use me as an emotional heart target. Receive from that. Put your, put your vindication down on that and say, listen, I've got to move forward. But here are some, some truths that I want to tell you that, that are going to come to you. And here are some lies. And I just want to expose some more of the lies that you should be thankful. The problem is you're not thankful enough. No, that's not the problem, okay? The problem is that you're not thankful enough. There are people with much bigger problems than yours. Your problems are yours. You shouldn't be compared to someone else's. God is the author of your suffering. I'm just going to move right along before I lose it. That is dumb. And you have my full permission to smack anybody that said that to you. Sunday morning while they're on the pulpit. <laughs> this is your fault if you weren't so serious all the time. I have in my notes these inappropriate jokes at these times that I'm not going to say now, but I will put this reference. It's like telling someone you're dumb so they don't feel dumb. That never works. All right? You're too serious. It's not that bad. You're not really suffering. And then probably the, one of the ones that I, I really don't like, and it's about what I said, I have it worse than you do. You see, because people are hurting inside, and they've been wounded inside. And we live in a culture where we're constantly having information going in. And if you are a processor, if you need to know and figure stuff out, you are trying to figure this out while information is coming at you a thousand miles an hour. And you are looking towards the church and you are looking towards God and you are believing for an answer. So let me tell you what I will say. I will say this, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that while you were in your mother's womb, that you are the apple of your father's eye and that you are his masterpiece and that he did not make one mistake when he made you and that his hand is upon you, that he will not leave you, nor will he forsake you, that his blessing rests on you because you are his people, you are his chosen family, that he will pay the highest price for because you are of the highest value to him. He calls you daughter and he calls you son, one which he will never get rid of. That will be said to you every night, for the next six weeks and until Jesus comes back because that's the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I would not go anywhere. I was in worship today thinking about what it would take for me to lay my son down to, to where he would die. And I'll tell you right now, there is nobody so that I would pay that price for. I would say, send me instead, God, because that's what most men would say. But to think God would give what he loved the most for us, for you, that is something we need to hold dearly. And inside, you're like, Pastor, I've heard this too. I know. I know you've heard this. But if your emotions have shut down or if they've caused you to be numb or they've caused you to be in a blank place, a place you can't describe, I want to say this to you. You are loved even when you are silent. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to explain to us why you're hurting, that we are here for you regardless of the why because of who you are. It's safe to not be okay. I love to celebrate when God has financial breakthroughs and healing breakthroughs in people's bodies. But I will not allow our church to become a horse and pony show to where those of us who are still believing for the breakthrough almost feel like we're less than those who have received it. That is allowing a spirit of comparison and condemnation into the people of God. And we will not do that. So you're thinking, okay, well, If I feel this way, 
It has to be something broken inside of me, something I don't know. I, I, how can I worship God and not feel anything? How can I do something for God and not feel anything? How can I be used by God and not feel anything? I can't be numb and still be affected. Loved one, beloved God is saying to you, you absolutely still can. Jesus' most rejected moments, he did some of his greatest works. He faced utter rejection on the cross and saved humanity. Okay, Jesus is a high standard. Let's look at someone else. King David would write this. King David, the only guy who we've ever known to ever bring peace to the Middle East. King David, he writes the longest book in the Bible. He is the worship leader of worship leaders. He is a man after God's own heart. That's how God describes him. If God could describe me as anything, if he would say, a man after my own heart, I would be floored. I would love it. That's how he describes David. He calls three people in scripture, my friend, David is one of them. So to be used by God, this guy was used by God. God's city is named the city of David, Jerusalem. All right, so how is he doing emotionally inside? Obviously, he should just be waking up and singing Bethel songs and listening to Joyce Myers on his way to work, of course, right? Yeah, he's rocking the Z too. He had like 80 kids, so probably. But like, you want to hear what he writes? This is what David writes. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? Will you forget me forever? How many of you guys have feel you feel right now like God has forgotten you? Like your troubles are still there. Your hands are up. You're praising up. You're looking up. But your troubles are still there. Your bills are still there. Your spouse ain't here. You got issues and you're trying to work through them. And you're like, God, where are you? David says, I know how you feel. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? He's saying, how long am I going to talk to myself about this? When are you going to interject? When am I going to hear from you? When are we going to be a part of this together? Having sorrow in my heart daily. How long will my enemies be exalted over me? Sounds like he has some anxiety. I think this man of God knows what depression feels like. I feel like he would know what the darkness feels like and have to trust in God. Consider and hear me, O oh Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. He says, God, it feels like you're not even there. It feels like, my, it feels like I'm just talking in the air. How long is it going to be like this? How long are you not going to answer me? How, what's going on, God? I, I'm trying to figure this out myself, but I just can't. I've looked on Google. I've looked on Bing. I've talked to my friends. I've done every search that I can search, and I just can't figure it out. You know, I'm feeling this every day, God. Every day I wake up, it feels like my heart and my soul are crying. I don't know an end to the pain. When will this world hang over me? When will, just, when will it not look like not worshiping you is better than worshiping you? Because as it looks right now, Hear me, God, as it looks right now, you're going to need to show me your goodness because I feel like dying right now. And it looks like every bit that's pressing down on me is going to win. Are you going to give me over to all of that? That's what he's saying. And here's the crazy thing. Outside of what he's saying, a lot of you know exactly how he's feeling. I know I do. I know I've been there. I know I've gotten out of my Jeep Cherokee at the time and went by this lake that was outside and I was just, I had a moment like this. And I think all of you have too. But this is what makes David, David. 
And it's not because he was good with a sling. And it's not because he knew how to write music and he was a wordsmith. But because he turns in a place where his heart is wounded and he is beat down. And he doesn't look on the actions of this world, but he looks onto the character of God. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt me bountifully with me. Because he has dealt bountifully with me. In the dark, in the hurt, we have got to find a place where we say, I will not look upon my emotions. I will not stand upon my circumstance, but I will look upon the character of God and I will say this, I will have to rejoice. I will praise and I will sing to the Lord. Very clearly in scripture, it says that praise, the sacrifice of praise, because for some of us to come to the place to get back focused upon what God can be saying, what God is doing in our life, it is a sacrifice through the emotions and the feelings and the experience that we're living through in the now. But you have to trust and know that he is God and he is good and he is not done yet. Depression will not win and anxiety will not win. David did not die with depression nor anxiety. He laid to rest peacefully. Moses also who would write some pretty stuff where you're like, wow, and same with Elijah, also did not die with depression. Moses actually chose. He said, I'm going to go up this mountain, and I'm going to be gone. You will not end with this. God is good. You have to look upon the character of God. And this is just one thing. Listen. This is just one thing. I do not have one pill for you to walk away and take and be okay. It's a process. It's a road. And we'll go down that road together. Because he has dealt bountifully with me. Which means he's good to me. He's good. He's good. So how do I do this? How do I take my life back? Now I'm going to shift back over and I'm really talking to everybody and you know when I do that and I go into that stuff because it's been on my heart um, you need to take in mind that mezzanine isn't just for you it's for you to get filled up and for you to have a knowledge of the word to minister to somebody else because I'm talking to a congregation of ministers right now so how do we do it anybody ever hear the holy huddle I hate that term I love football that much don't disrespect the huddle. It's important, okay? Be good in a no-huddle offense. Can I get an amen, Max? Thank you. Be good. All right, two minutes. You need to do this right, guys. But they said, anybody know, like, what the holy huddle is? You know what the holy huddle is? Us four and no more. It's all, the, like, the click of the church because churches are, are clicky. And guess what? If you're new, mezzanine's clicky. Why? Because we're humans, all right? I'm sorry. Go to a bar and not everybody's going to be like, hey, you come sit with me. They're going to sit around their friends and talk to their friends. We do our best to show the love of God. And, um, you know, so that's where we're at with that. Um, how do we get here? That's why I shouldn't leave my notes. <laughs> Holy huddle. Us four and no more is what usually like gets phrased as. It's like us four, we get together, we make all the decisions for the church. We're the only people that sit together and talk together. We don't let nobody else from the outside in. It's like a huddle. When everybody approaches, you just get the backs of the person. Super annoying, super not Christ-like. I can't stand it. Um, but I want to rephrase that. I want to get the holy huddle back because I believe whether if you are going through something emotionally inside or lack of emotionally inside or what place or who you are in your life, if you want to take that place of worship to the next level, you got to be able to have a holy huddle. You have to be able to have a holy huddle. I'll close out with this too if you're sitting there and your bladder is wanting to have a holy moment as well, that I'll be ending soon. But hang with me on this. Because this is super important. See, the holy huddle, and I was just, man, this sounded way better when I was writing it. Um, a huddle is where you go back to get focused, to get the plan. Worship 
Worship, a key component of worship is positioning. The dog, the look, the extending the love is a focused, positioned love. If you're going to bow, it's a positioning thing. If I was to bow to Quentin right now, I could not come over and bow this way. He would be like, he didn't bow to me. You would be like, you bowed to Jessica, and that was weird, you know. So it's a positioning. You have got to look. You've got to be able to be in line and know what's going on because we... Are you still? Okay, I got my microphone. I don't care. All right, here we go. All right. I'm not stopping this part because I believe in this. All right. I'm going to preach 100 miles an hour. I'm going to preach like my mom, an angry Spanish woman. All right? <laughs> Here's the problem why a lot of us miss a lot of worship, all right? It's because we don't position ourselves right. Because we allow ourselves throughout our day to be so distracted by every little thing that goes on that we're constantly like one of those ducks that's like, ding. Ding, at a fair. I should have said at a fair before I did that. And, uh, like, and you are constantly going in different directions by things that hit you. God is saying, go in my direction and give me your focus. Come to me. Come to me. I will point out the very direction you need to go. Jesus is at the position with the woman at the well because God told him a direction to go. God gave him a calling. He wasn't randomly walking this earth like Cain on Kung Fu. He had an assignment. You need your assignment. Some of you guys are thinking, I would love to get that. But God's silent. Silent your cell phone for a season. Wake up a little bit early. It says that Jesus would rise early in the morning before all the rest of the people, before the sun would come up, and he would go and pray. Okay, I get it. You're going to tell me to pray, Pastor. I spirit so slap. All right, stay focused. It's more than that. Okay? It's more than that. Because this is what he says. The author of Hebrews writes. He says, listen, listen, Hebrews 11, 6, but without Faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. So you must believe in God. You must believe that he is, and not only that he exists, but and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Those who are, come on, give him praise. Give him praise for it. Listen, you've got to be focused with what you're going to do with your moments here on this earth. When he says, listen, you have got to, first of all, if you believe in me, how crazy is it, Kerrigan, right now, that if you think of all of this universe, every star, every moon, every sun, this could be the guardians of the galaxy in me. I don't care. Track with me, okay, that the solar system is expanding you look in the sky and you are asking about aliens, but the person who knows every mountain, every spot, every hill on every one of those planets is a human being named Jesus Christ. And he is looking to hear your prayers. You get in one fight with your boyfriend and you're calling your mom, your sister, your best friend for advice. You get, why don't you call the author and finisher of your faith? Why don't you call the one who knows the very end from the beginning? Why don't you call the one that has the very answer for you? What college should I go to? Should I go to FSU or UF? Who should I date? What should I do? Why don't you ask the one who put you very together, who loves you more than anybody can love you, who would sacrifice anything for you? He, that's what he means when he says, diligently seek me. Give sacrifice yourself, not on an altar, not with any crap that we can't measure, but in what matters to us. Where in your life are you bowing down and saying, God, I give you this time of my life? Snapchat and Instagram can wait. I'm going to give you this. Why? Because you matter to me. And then inside this moment, I'm going to let you know how much you mean to me. And I'm going to submit my heart to what you have to say to me. Because I want to worship you. Because I want to worship you. Why? Because you want a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife or you want an extra raise or you want whatever. No. No. Because you know that he's the one and he's your everything. But when you step into this, he says, I will diligently, I, will, I am a rewarder of those who seek me. Some of you aren't experiencing breakthrough 
It ain't because you have a lack of been through. It's because you have a whole lot of won't go through. And it's the truth. You don't want to go and hear what he has to say. Stop having sex with that person. Stop going and getting drunk. How about this? How about you stop sleeping in and write the song I've put on your heart before I give it to somebody else? Before I give it to Chris Tomlin, you get all mad it's on Z88, not on your station. That homeboy's probably racked up 100 people's songs already. Why? Because they like to sleep in and he don't. Oh, it's always sin. It's always those marijuana cigarettes that be stopping the kingdom of God. No, it's your pillow sometimes too. Thank you. I love your laugh. Keeps me going. It's your pillow too. You have to know. You have to know. That he is looking. Psalms 3 8 says that too. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It says, you know, uh, the blessing rests on his people. Victory is from you, O God, and the blessing rests upon your people. It rests. If my phone is resting on this pulpit right now, and Amanda, if you want to come up, that'd be great. It's resting on this pulpit, it's not going anywhere. You understand, his blessing on you is not going anywhere. Those of us who diligently seek him, that he is looking because we need the focus and the path he is going to take us on, there is going to be a blessing on. I want to end this portion, this conversation. I want to end the service with this. In a moment, we'll have the prayer counselors come up. But if you guys could just stay in with me on this one, that he speaks, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah. When you look at the book of Isaiah, it is the cleft notes of the Bible that it is... uh, 66 books are written in the Bible. There are 66 chapters inside of the book of Isaiah. Some people say that you can find Jesus in every single chapter of Isaiah, just like you should be able to find Jesus in the books of the Bible. And as you look at the 55th chapter of Isaiah, I have picked out some scriptures here, not because I like to pick scripture apart. So if if that frustrates you, please, for a second, get over it. And go back and read Isaiah 55. It's not going anywhere. Um, But listen to the conversation God wants to have. He says, listen, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than yours. He's saying I have the answer. You know what, depression and anxiety are different for everybody. They are, and that's why as a man who loves you and as a pastor who cares about you, that I can't have the one cure-all pill for you, but my Bible tells me that I know the one who does. And he's walking this journey with you, and he's saying, seek me while I may be found. But because of Jesus, he's not going anywhere. And when you feel comfortable to speak, he's listening. His ways are higher. He's saying he knows you've been to the end of every road and hope seems like a lost dream. But he says he knows ways that you've never even heard of and known of. That's why we call Jesus the Prince of Peace. He says, my peace I I leave with you. Not the peace that you guys know. Real peace. So shall my word be that it goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. God did not just send his word randomly into this world. He sent it to each one of us. He sent it to you and he sent it to me. And God has a promise for you that he will not allow his word to come back to him without it producing every bit of what he intended for it to produce. That all the promises of God are yes and amen. We have to grab hold of that with our faith as we diligently go down this road that we call life, that we know that the one who loves us more than anything is bringing out of us the best in us that he put in us. And that no matter if we feel it or don't, we keep going because we know, we know what he has for us is good. That he's not going to quit. He paid a high price so we could have a life of peace. So we could look out. So we could come to this place 
and put on music and with our excitement extend our love bow our knee and give honor to the one who deserves it if you bow your heads if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus if you're like man I I just I've heard about God but I want to give Jesus my heart you want to say that I I just feel, I know, I know inside that he's my answer. If you want to take that step out and say, listen, I'm done living this crazy life where I'm the king, where I allow idols to stay in my heart, but instead, God, I want you to take your rightful place in my heart. And I want to call you Lord and Savior. If you're saved, don't raise your hand. I want this just to be a moment between if you've never called Jesus your Lord and Savior, between you and your heavenly Father. So it's no one looking around. If that's you, if you want to have that moment today and know that the entire kingdom of heaven is yours, will you just raise your hand right now, throw it up with nobody looking around. Nobody looking around. I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to take your picture and put it on Instagram. It's just you, you and God. All right? So we didn't have anybody raise their hand. And like I said before, that's okay. That's okay. If you're looking at God, God's looking at you. And if you're looking to figure this out, he's looking to figure this out with you. It's okay. Just know one thing. Two things, that you're loved and you're home. Father, right now I just speak a blessing and a life over all my brothers and sisters that are here tonight. That right now as you're pulling chains off the people that the, 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 the accuser, that the liar might have placed on, that hurt and that broken men and women might have inflicted the wounds that you're putting healing on. You're restoring. You're inspiring. Father, Monday morning will not be the same because we gave you these moments right now. Let us not forget what you've spoken to our hearts in these moments. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the prayer counselors will come up now. You guys hang out. Love on each other. Super excited. Um, by love on each other, I mean don't be too clicky and hang out. I don't mean like do anything weird. Um, so, all right, guys. That was the mezzanine. Love you guys.